going to stay in the same vein. Third John, the first chapter, and the second verse. Let's say this together. This is our series uh, text. It says this, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. I want to also lift up a familiar scripture in which I will um, be ministering from today. It is Matthew, the sixth chapter, and the 33rd verse. It's very familiar. It says this, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. Somebody say all these things. All these things will be added, shall be added unto you. And so in this series in 360 Prosperity, we've been taught real well that to prosper is to do well for oneself. Pastor D taught us that in the Greek it means to help one's way. And a simple definition of prosper is to do better. Somebody say, I'm doing better. I'm doing better. And so our aim is to do better in our faith, our faculties, our family, and our finances. And so to do better in our faith is connected, thank you, to prosperity. For the Bible declares that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And then Pastor Wells, he taught us the degrees of faith. Let's see, the degrees of faith. It was no faith, little faith, shipwrecked faith, y'all a good class, and great, great, great faith. And then they taught us about our faculties, doing better in our faculties, and that's our spirit, our soul, and our body. That's connected to 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23. I'm just doing a quick review. And that is to be whole in one soul. Pastor D came yes, uh, last Sunday and just wrecked the whole church. She said, it is well with my soul. And so that's about finding rest for your soul. How many know we need rest for our soul? In these tests and trying times, we need, we need to find rest for our soul. And so that's what we're going to do. This 360 prosperity, it's all about doing better. And I've used this analogy um, before, but, but it's just like this. It's just like one of my favorite shows, House Hunters right? You buy a house. I was looking at a house a couple weeks ago and Deacon Petrina, she said, uh, Rachel, what you think about this town home? And I said this and that. She said, Rachel, what you have to do is you have to find a floor plan. You have to find, you have to find the bones that you like and you can always get in the house and do better. It's like this church. This church used to be a daycare, but we seen the bones that we, we see. Okay. So when I, I, I see, I have a vision for it. So when I'm in here and so this, this church has been transformed. We had the bones, but we could do better. We could do better. We can do better. That's so much like God that he takes you just as you are. He takes you just as you are. The Bible says, come to me right? But he says, I want you to do better. I never wanted you to stay the same. I had prosperous. I want you to have prosperity. It's not just connected to money, but it's wholeness in every area of your soul. Amen. And so what I found is this, is a life that is stagnant or a life that is regressing is a life that may have made Jesus savior, but they haven't made him Lord over all. Did you hear what I said? I said a life that is stagnant or a life that is regressing, I'm taking steps back, is a life that may have made Jesus Savior, but may we not Lord over all. Savior says, I need saving for my soul. I need help in an emergency. I need help, this and that. But Lordship says, Lord, you can have it all. In the good times, in the bad times, in my faith, in my faculties, my finances, my family, there is nothing off limits when you have made Jesus Lord over your life. And so what this series really is, is an evaluation of your life. And I sat down even yesterday and I evaluated my life and I said, Lord, where have I prospered? Where have I done better just compared to last year? And what area have I been stagnant? Now, if you can't tell the truth to yourself, I don't know, I don't know what you, 
I don't know what you're going to do. But if you sit down, this is an evaluation like, Lord, where have I been stagnant in my faith? Where have I regressed in my faculties? It is an evaluation. And some things, it's very tricky because some things you do better and some things you're stagnant and regressing. Some things are internal and some things are external. You could be stagnant and regressing internally, meaning nobody knows but you. It's between you and God. And then you could be stagnant or regressing externally and everybody sees. My thing is we got to live the same life privately and publicly. Amen. Can I get an amen? Amen. And so what I've come to do is just add on to this series of 360 prosperity. And our scripture says this, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you, unto you. And so what I want to talk to you today about from the subject entitled, The Precedence for Prosperity. Can you say that with me? The Precedence for Prosperity. Come on, use your outside voice. The Precedence for Prosperity. Precedence is the condition of being dealt with before other things or to be considered more important. Y'all write your notes. Do I need to say that again? Precedence, she said, thank you. The condition of being dealt with before other things or, de or to be considered more important. A synonym for precedence is priority. Priority, priority. It's like in the Gospels where Mary and Martha and Jesus goes to the house of Mary and Martha. And Martha is worried about working, doing stuff in the house. And Mary is at the feet of Jesus. And Martha comes to Jesus and he says, and she says, Jesus, tell Mary to come help me work. And Jesus says, no, I'm not saying, Martha, what you're doing is wrong. But what I'm trying to set up is priority. What I'm trying to set up is order. What I'm trying to set up is precedent. Yeah. I need you to work, but I need you to have a worship before you work. I need you to sit at the feet of Jesus before you work. So what I'm telling you, Mary and Martha, I'm not telling you to give up your responsibilities or even to give up your hustle or to even give up um, um, the things that are your responsibilities. But what I'm saying is this, make sure that first thing is first thing. Make sure you have the right priority because the thing is this, if you're hustling, you're working, and Jesus is not backing what you're working, you will run into a constant fatigue because there is no grace for what you're doing because you have no backing. I don't know about you, but I want some backing in anything I'm doing. Paul says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. I need grace for this. I need grace for this so that when I'm doing stuff, it don't even look hard because I got the grace for this. I got the power, equipment to do the will of the Lord. And so I need precedence for prosperity. The Bible says this, seek ye first the kingdom of God. It is a phrase that we hear, a colloquialism that we hear so often in the body of Christ. But what does it really mean to seek first the kingdom of God for your life. It's this, to seek first the kingdom of God is a commitment to find and to do the will of God, to ally oneself totally with his purpose, and this commitment must come first. Can I say that again? To seek first the kingdom of God, it is a commitment to find and do the will of God, to ally oneself totally with his purpose. Somebody say his purpose. And it is, this commitment must come first. Let me give you some practical tips to seek first the kingdom of God. And then we're going to get into the scripture. Y'all do love the Bible, right? All right, let me give you some practical tips to seek first the kingdom of God. It's to seek, it's to serve, and it's to sow. I said it's to seek, it's to serve, and it's to sow. I believe it was David. He said, early in the morning will I seek you. And so if you're going to put the kingdom of God first, early in the morning, before you pick up the phone, before you go do some work, 
if you would put him as a priority early in the morning, when I turn over, I get on my knees. And I'm putting the kingdom of God first. Why? I want to know, Lord, what do you want to do on the earth through me this day? And I can only find that when I'm on my knees. I can only find that when I have the proper priority, the proper perspective. So I got to see. I got to see. What was number two? I got to serve. I got to serve. I got to serve. I got to serve. The Bible talks about being faithful in another man's field. Well, we may not have a field or yard or anything like that, but you have to have the ability to submit. Submission is to get under a mission. To get under a mission. There's a mission here at Kingdom Life. What's our mission? To establish kingdom-minded people. And so I'm doing whatever I can to fit under that mission, to push the kingdom of God forward. I have to get under a mission. So we got seek, serve, and the last thing is to sow. To sow, to sow, specifically your money. I promise we're not taking up an, another offering, but I'm trying to get you to prosper. This isn't a gimmick or a game. I, my life is a testimony, Elder Robin, that, that the kingdom, the principles of God work if you work them. And so you have to sow. Sowing takes intentionality. You have to scatter your seeds. The Bible says he gives seeds to the sower. He gives seed to the sower. And so sometimes you wonder why you don't got enough seed in your hand. Maybe you're not a sower. But if I have the proper perspective on money, if you're going to be prosperous, you need the proper perspective of money. So if you're going to seek first the kingdom of God, you got to seek, you got to serve, and you got a soul. It's amazing what happens when you put the kingdom of God first. It's amazing what happens when you put God's business first. When you put his business first, your business will always be taken care of exceedingly, abundantly, above all, more than I can ask, think, or imagine. Let me show you this in the text because y'all looking at me funny like I'm making this up. Somebody say, bake me a cake. First Kings, the 17th chapter. I'm going to read it in the Amplified Classic Version. Somebody say, bake me a cake. Bake me a cake as fast as you can. All right, verse number eight. Sister Maisha, we're just going to keep this thing rolling. That's all right? All right. Are y'all there? Maisha's there, but are y'all there? Amen. It says this, and the word of the Lord came to him. This is to Elijah. He says, arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sinai, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. Verse 10 says, so he arose, this is Elijah, he arose and went to Zarephath. When he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and he said, bring me a little water in a vessel that I may, that I may drink. Okay, okay. Verse 11 says, and she was going, as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So he said, bring me some water and bring me some bread. Like, all right, you asked her for too much then. And she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have not a loaf baked but only a handful of meal in the jar and a little oil in the bottle. See, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and bake it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. Uh-huh, what does the next verse say? And Elijah said to her, fear not, go and do just as you have said, but make me a little cake first. Somebody say, make me a cake. Make me a cake and bring it to me first. And afterwards, prepare some for yourself and your son. Uh-huh. And the Bible says, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of meal shall not waste away, or the bottle of oil fell unto the day of the Lord sends rain upon the earth. Uh-huh. 15 says she's did just as Elijah said, obedience is so much better. And she and he and her household ate. For many days. 16. I love this. It says the jar of meal was not spent, nor did the bottle of oil fail, according to the word which the Lord spoke through the prophet 
Elijah. Let me stop right here and bring you up to the text. If you look in the early verses of chapter 17, I'm going to tell you about it. You don't have to go there. There is a drought in the land. Somebody said there's a drought in the land. There's a drought in the land, and the Bible says that God had commanded the ravens to feed Elijah. The ravens on a daily basis brought Elijah bread, and they brought him meat. And the Bible says that he got water from the brook. But here we are in the text that the brook dried up. Somebody say the brook dried up. Lord have mercy, the book dried up. Have you ever been in a dried up situation? What do you do when you're in a dried up situation? I got good news for you that you can still prosper in a drought. You can still prosper. You can still prosper in a drought. And I love this about God. I love this about God because it's in the text, we have two people that are in a drought. We got Elijah, he's in a drought, and we got this widow, she's in a drought. She's preparing to bake her a cake and to die. Why? Because she is a widow, and so her source, her husband, is no longer here. He's dead. But the Bible says, bake me a cake. And so God, I believe God with all of my heart, he could have fed Elijah however he wanted to. At the wells, he was being fed by ravens. He was fed and fed by birds. But God had this widow in mind. He said, come on, bake him a cake. Why? because I want you to be a part of this prosperity story and y'all may say why in the world would God ask for the last of a widow why would he ask for a last of a widow but the reality is he was not trying to break her he was trying to prosper her he was trying to get her to do better do better I'm commanding the widow to feed you. I'm about to introduce you both to a new source. I'm about to introduce you both to a new source. And I said, Lord, so I read the text and I ask questions when I read the text. And I said, Lord, why would you require the last of a widow? That just seems so unreasonable. And I heard him so clear. He said, Rachel, he says, because oftentimes if you really want to prosper, it requires a sacrifice. Uh-oh. If you really want to prosper, Dominique, it requires a sacrifice. If you really want to grow in your faith, it requires a sacrifice. Maybe you got to wake up in the midnight hour just to pray, just to talk to him. If you really want to prosper in your soul, maybe you got to cut off some friends that are no good for you. If you really want to prosper in your health, maybe you can't eat sweets every day. Maybe some days, but not every day. If you really want to prosper in your finances, maybe you got to go to the grocery store and stop eating out five times a week. If you really want to prosper, it requires requires a sacrifice and the problem with our society today is we don't like sacrifice we like convenience uh oh uh oh we like Burger King we like to have it our way we like to go through the drive through and look don't let them take too long with my food we like convenience we don't like sacrifice but something happens when you put food in a crock pot Something happens when it takes time. Something happens when you put that pot roast in early and go to work and come home. It tastes a little bit different. I'm trying to give y'all practical ways to prosper. Y'all making Chick-fil-A rich. Y'all better go home and get y'all some antibiotic free chicken and get y'all some Chick-fil-A at the house. I'm meddling. Let me go ahead. Let me go ahead. The Bible says, seek ye first. And so this woman of God, this widow is thinking about death and God has prosperity in his mind. He says, seek ye first because prosperity was connected to supplying the prophet. And the prophet was connected to declaring the word of the Lord in a drought to the whole land. So y'all see a widow just baking a cake, but I see Elijah connected to the kingdom of God because the Bible says this, when the kingdom of God is your priority, that God will make your stuff a priority. Let me give you another example because I still see you looking at me funny. Second Chronicles, we're flying now. Second Chronicles. The first chapter, let's start at the sixth verse. I'm going to read it in the New King James Version. 
Are you here? All right, it is the precedence for prosperity. Amen. Let me show you another example, just in case you don't believe me. And the Bible says, And Solomon went up there to the bronze altar before the Lord, which was at the tabernacle of meeting. And he offered a thousand burnt offerings on it. Verse 7 says, On that night, God appeared to Solomon, and he said to him, Ask, what shall I give you? What a prosperous, what a friend of God. When God can ask you, ask me, what shall I do for you? And Solomon said to God, you have shown great mercy to David, my father, and have made me king in his place. Now, O Lord God, let your promise to David, my father, be established, for you made him you have made me king over people like the dust of the earth in multitude. Uh-huh. Verse, verse 10 says this. Now give me wisdom. Solomon, this is his request before the Lord. He said, give me wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people. For who can judge the great people of what? Of yours. These are your people, God. And it says, then God said to Solomon, because this was in your heart. And you have not asked riches or wealth or honor or the life of your enemies, nor have you asked long life, but you have asked wisdom and knowledge for yourself that you may judge. Whose people? These are God's people over whom I have made you king. Verse 12 says this, wisdom, I love this, wisdom and knowledge are granted to you. And I will also give you riches and wealth and honor, such as none of the kings who have were before you, nor shall any after you have the like. Why? Because you put my kingdom first. Because you put my perspective first. And when you put God's kingdom first, I promise you he won't disappoint you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. It is the precedence for prosperity. But I got to give you the truth. Somebody say, tell the truth. There is also a prosperity that this world offers. The world has a formula for prosperity. Oftentimes you got to lie, cheat, steal, sleep, creep, finesse your way to make it somewhere. But the Bible says this in Matthew, the fourth chapter, verse number eight. Here we find Jesus led up. He's tempted of the devil. And this is the third time that the devil comes to him. There's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new under the sun. The world has a formula. And the Bible says this. Again, the devil took Jesus up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Uh-huh. And he said to him, he said to Jesus, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus responds. He says, away with you, Satan. For it is written that you should worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Can I stop right here to say this? That the world has a formula for prosperity. It's so sad because some of these people that we idolize, some of these people on this world wide web, they have illegitimate prosperity and we envy people that have illegitimate prosperity. Lord have mercy. Some of these people on your job have illegitimate prosperity and made their way up illegitimately. But I don't know about you, but any prosperity that I want, I want it from God. The Bible says promotion comes not from the east or the west, but promotion comes from, comes from the Lord, from the Lord. I want prosperity God's way. You know why? Because when you seek first the kingdom of God and you prosper, it is accompanied by peace. Somebody say peace. When you have peace and you're prosperous, you don't have to look over your shoulder. You don't have to lose sleep at night. Why? Because I know God, everything that I am and everything that I'm not, I know for sure without a shadow of a doubt, God gave me this. Come on, I said God gave me this. And peace is so essential when you are a prosperous man or woman because I'm going to tell you the truth. Peace is essential when you are a prosperous person because the problem of prosperity, somebody said there's a problem with prosperity. 
You need peace because the problem of prosperity is it attracts envy. I'm going to show you in the text because I'm not just talking about me. Genesis 26. In the 12th chapter, it says, Then Isaac sold in that land, and he reaped in the same year a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him. The man began to prosper, and he continued prospering until he became what? This is a very prosperous man. For he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great number of servants. He had a lot of things. He had a lot of authority. He had a lot of power. And the Bible says, because of his prosperity, the Philistines envied him the more. The problem of prosperity is that it attracts envy. It's when you are resented you are, people are jealous of you because of your possessions, because of your qualities, or I'm going to add this, because of the anointing on your life. How many know that the anointing on your life attracts envy? The thing about envy is this, envy is a heart posture, and it will never be allowed to hide long because envy has a kin to hatred and Envy has a kid to jealousy and it's akin to it's akin to backbiting and talking behind your back. I got a question for you. Can you stand to be prosperous? Can you stand to have people talk about you? Like who do you think that you are? We from the same hood. You know what I'm saying? We from the same mother and father. Can you stand to be prosperous when your siblings talk about you? When your family can you stand to be prosperous? Can you stand to be prosperous? Because unfortunately, it attracts envy. So this is not a surprise. I'm telling you what prosperity really attracts. Whether you're prosperous in your finances, in your family, who do they think they are that they have a, make their family look so good? In your faculties, who she thinks she is? Her body looking better. What you mean you don't eat that no more? Oh, so we grew up on the same chitlins and fat back and hog. Who do you think? Oh, so you done got high sedity. You done moved out the city. And now you done changed how you act. Can you stand to be prosperous? Can you stand? Can you stand to be prosperous? Uh-oh. Can you stand... Hmm. Can you stand to be prosperous? What I'm telling you is that still in the midst of it all, don't lose your seat. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Why? Because you need peace. You need an anchor for your soul. You need a counselor. And you need a compass. I'm closing. Something very peculiar happens when you seek first the kingdom of God. Pastor Tim, if you would come, something peculiar happens. If you would just stand here and turn, face the crowd, face the audience, thank you. Something peculiar happens when you seek first the kingdom of God. Many of you all know this is my father. If you would stand this way. Who is this, y'all? This is my father. Now, I have had my father's heart for almost over 31 years now. I've disappointed him, I've had his heart. I've made him proud, I've had his heart. I failed, I've had his heart. I've brought honor to his last name, still made him proud, still had his heart. I've communicated with him, so I've had his heart. We've been knitted even closer. So much so that my father I can pick up his countenance even without him saying a word. I know when he's sad, even if he's smiling. Why? Because we have a relationship. He is my father. So I've had his heart for over 31 years. This is a good man, y'all. Y'all know this is a good man. Can I just plug this? There's something so special that happens when a woman has been loved well. That's just a plug. You just don't settle for anything when you've been loved well. That's just a little plug. 
And so, and so, and so I've had his heart for over 31 years. And because I've had his heart, my mom's not gonna like this part. I can have his resources. <laughs> listen, listen. Right? Are y'all here? Because I have his heart, I can have what's in his hand. Thank you, Dad. And the problem, because I have his heart, I can have what's in his hand. And the problem that I see in our society today is that we look for the hand of God before we look for his heart. I want to know your heart. I want to be so in sync with you that I can do your bidding on the earth. Y'all, God is not a sugar daddy. Lord have mercy. He is not a God that just comes through in the emergencies, but God is a God. This is all I've came to tell you today. That yes, we're pursuing 360 prosperity, but he is the object of my prosperity. He has my affection. He's won our attention. Everybody's standing. God, we need you. The seasoned saints would say, if I have Jesus, I have enough to start all over. Because it's in him that I move and I breathe and I have my being. It's in him that gives me the ability to prosper. And without him, I could do nothing. Without God, I can do nothing. So if you would just...